Hi there. This is Marielle Conception, your host of the My DPC Story podcast. Have you or someone you care about ever been burned by the U.S. healthcare system? If so, you are listening to the right video, because if you are listening, chances are the answer is yes. But the U.S. spends so much on healthcare. Why are so many Americans affected personally and especially financially by the healthcare system? Shouldn't that mean we have better healthcare access and treatment options? Shouldn't it be easy for us to be able to see our doctor when we need to instead of turning to the ER or urgent care? Historically, it's been seemingly impossible to answer these questions, but now that is changing through the direct primary care movement. This video that you have tuned into will bring you into the world of direct primary care and show you how physicians all over the country are changing the way they practice so patients from all backgrounds get the high quality care they need and deserve, which makes for both happy patients and physicians. Learn even more by subscribing to the My DPC Story YouTube channel. Find us on all major podcast platforms. Find us on socials at My DPC Story and at MyDPCStory.com. There you can find resources including how to find a DPC doctor near you, conferences about DPC, DPC startup guides and advice, a store with DPC swag, and even a mapper showing where podcast guests are practicing. Thanks for tuning in to hear about this powerful movement. Now, on to the episode. Primary care is an innovative, alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever-so-relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. So direct primary care to me is a modern approach to old fashioned family medicine. It is breaking down the barriers and things that get in the way of the doctor patient relationship so that we can focus on what really matters for the true health and wellness of our patients, for their families and for our community. I am Dr. Christina Gonzalez of Hope Family Medicine, and this is my DPC story. Dr. Christina Gonzalez is a board-certified family physician. She grew up in the Adirondack Mountains area of upstate New York. And then, after earning a BA in psychology from Gordon College, she lived and worked in Boston for a few years and completed her pre-med classes at Harvard University. Then she headed off to medical school and graduated from New York College of Osteopathic Medicine just outside New York City. She then went on to Kansas to train at the Via Christi Family Medicine Residency Program. While she is far away from where she grew up, she loves the life that she's built in El Dorado, not El Dorado, Kansas, with her husband Pablo and their gaggle of children. When not seeing patients, you might find her chasing after her kids, cooking, enjoying time out on the lake, or going on adventures with her husband and kids. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. You have had such a unique journey because you grew up in New York and along your medical training and your medical journey to opening up your DBC, you've had experiences overseas. So can you please share with the listeners about your journey in medicine that led you to eventually learn about DPC? Yeah. So the story of how I became a doctor, I think it really intertwines with how I became a direct primary care doctor. Like it's kind of almost one in the same. I can't say doctor and then became DPC or doctor and then became primary care because they really kind of flow together. I could probably take your whole podcast to explain the whole story, but I'll try to be really succinct and tell kind of the highlights. I actually, when I was really young, I was six years old and I made my first diagnosis. I got out of the bathtub and I said, mom, look, I have Lyme disease and I had a bullseye rash. (laughs) And I said, look, I have Lyme disease just like you do. So my mom, my dad, and I all had Lyme disease growing up. And that kind of was defined our lives a lot. 
because back then they didn't really know how to treat people. There was a lot of kind of long-term sequela, especially, especially for my mom. And so health and wellness was kind of always in our, our um, history. I actually remember writing a journal entry where I said, I would never want to be a doctor who would want to be around sick people all the time. So that kind of went again, not against, but so I kind of had that in my background, but at the same time, I was really interested in it. I kind of always had that. If something is broke, I want to be the one to fix it. So I saw problems with um, how healthcare was when I was a kid and I really wanted to, to do something about it, but I didn't actually want to be a doctor. So growing up, I thought maybe I would do physical therapy. Maybe I would be a psychologist. I went to college and I had a degree in psychology because I figured whatever I wound up doing, that psychology was an important part of that. And so I graduated from college with a psychology degree and um, moved to Boston. And when I was in Boston, I I went on my I went on a mission trip with my church, and we went to Ethiopia. And what I will say is this: there are kind of two big defining, I guess, three things. So when I was in that kind of defined how I discovered what my like, vocational purpose in life was, I remember learning about Maslow's a hierarchy of needs. And I remember learning that physical needs were at the bottom of the pyramid. If you remember, it's like a pyramid and at the top is self-actualization, but physical needs were at the bottom. And I am a Christian. And so my faith was important to me, but I never wanted to be a missionary. I didn't want to be, you know, out there evangelizing sort of thing. I wanted to address, I guess I always knew I wanted to like show love rather than tell love, if that makes sense. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs in eighth grade. And then in college, I there was a quote by, I think it's Frederick Buckner. That was our theme for, we had a, I think it was convocation one year where it said, the place that God calls you to is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And so I, at that time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew it was going to be helping people. It was in healthcare and it was definitely not a doctor. So I just said, well, I need to figure out where that deep need is. So when I, after college went to Ethiopia, I had this moment where I was literally standing on the road walking from the guest house to the hospital. And it was just like this like wave of like, this is it. Like, this is that intersection. This is where deep gladness and deep hunger meet. This is where, you know, physical needs and emotional needs and spiritual needs, they all come together. It was a really cool place that I was at. They, um, and this kind of where it sort of ties into DPC a little bit, not so much the financial model of it, but the concept of it is they worked with women and children who had HIV and AIDS, and that was their kind of identifier. And they took care of the whole person. They had counseling, they had financial classes, they um, helped people with small business loans, they did peer to peer counseling. Basically, they just They initially had started out as an HIV AIDS organization, but then once heart therapy came out and they were able to help people live longer, they said, we really need to just not be a hospice program, essentially, but be a program that takes care of these people. And it just changed lives. And so I was like, gosh, if I could do this in the United States, not that I didn't want to live in another country, it just kind of was like, well, if I could do this wherever I wound up that's what I want to do. Like it, where, where people recognize that physical needs and psychological needs were equally important and equally affected each other. So, so that trip was pretty amazing, but what was actually kind of the funny story about it is that on my flight back, I had this true epiphany. Like I was like, this is what I need to do. And, you know, I guess I'm supposed to be a doctor, even though I never wanted to be, but on my flight back, there was a doctor, his name was, I think, Dr. Irv or Irving. And he was a doctor from Texas. And in hindsight, I can see he was burnt out. He was like burnt to a crisp. (laughs) 
And I remember being on the plane and this was, you know, what is that back in 2006, 2007, being on the plane on the flight back, I said, gosh, I'm I'm thinking maybe I want to be a doctor. And he launched into this 10 point, you know, lesson on all the things wrong with healthcare about, you know, documentation and insurance and, and administration and all these things that were wrong with healthcare and ended it by saying, and if you want to go help the poor, then you should just be a PA. That's good enough. And I have nothing against PAs. I think there's absolutely can be a role for them, but I hated, I mean, it just like gnawed at me to the core he said, you know, if you if that's what you want to do, you should just go be a PA. And that just felt so wrong because I had thought about being a PA at one point because I I didn't think that I was I didn't think I was cut out to be a doctor in a lot of ways. And so I was like, well, gosh, I mean, I do want to help the poor and I don't want to be what that guy just said. So I um, went home and applied to med school and figured I wouldn't get in. And then I did. So that's how I became a doctor. I think maybe that didn't fully answer your question because I totally tangented. (laughs) This is another example of how this podcast is really highlighting the individual journeys of these, of DPC physicians all over the country, because the journey that we all take to get to being a part of the movement is, is absolutely unique for all of us. And when you talk about, what you saw and what you didn't want to see. And, you know, this idea that how could you have expected to sit on doc, to sit next to Dr. Irving or Dr. Irv on the plane? It's just, it's, it's pretty crazy how all of that happened. And, and, you know, the, the idea that at the time you were in Ethiopia, you were seeing the transition from them thinking about HIV as a chronic disease rather than as a, a life ending disease, like we used to, to, it's just, you know, it's it's great that you were in these places at the right time and that you had your epiphany. And so I want to ask now, after you applied to medical school, you thought you weren't going to get in and then you got in. Yeah. How did you end up learning about direct primary care as a business model and as a, a type of model that you wanted to pursue after residency? Stay with us. We'll be right back. My DPC story just hit 100,000 downloads on Apple Podcasts alone, and we could not have done it without our amazing listeners. So to thank you and to celebrate this milestone, we're giving away an incredible DPC Summit prize package for the DPC Summit happening in Minneapolis this summer. The prize includes My DPC Story swag, and on top of that, the prize also includes a ticket to the DPC Summit. Check out my interview with Dr. Jeff Davenport, where you'll hear more details about the summit. To be eligible for this giveaway, all you have to do is first rate and review My DPC Story on your podcast listening platform. Pro tip, if you rate My DPC Story with a five-star review, it helps the visibility of the podcast and it helps others to find all these DPC stories. Number two, take a screenshot of your review and email it to support at mydpcstory.com. You'll find that email in the show notes as well. And third, make sure you're following My DPC Story on all your social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. All the social links are at the bottom of mydpcstory.com and also in our show notes. For bonus points, share both this episode and the My DPC Story posts about the DPC Summit with your community. The winner will be announced in a future episode, so make sure you tune in to find out if you'll be heading to the summit. If you've already purchased your ticket and you're the winner, My DPC Story will send you a check for the price of your ticket. Thank you for listening to My DPC Story and best of luck. Yeah, so I went to medical school in New York and but I found out about this program called Via Christi, which is in Wichita, Kansas. And then I, um, I actually met Nick Thompson um, as a med student. And he told me, I said, so what do people do for fun there? And he, I joke about this with him all the time. And he said, uh, what do people do for fun there? And he said, well, we have a really nice YMCA. And that was the saddest thing I'd ever 
because I was like, really, you're going to try to convince me to move to Wichita because of YMCA. Anyway, so um, I proceeded to try to find a program that was similar to Via Christi that had that that kind of cowboy mentality where you learned how to do everything and you were like a family doctor who knew what you're doing rather than a family doctor who was like the bottom of the barrel couldn't get in anywhere else. So I was like, I can find that anywhere else. And I couldn't. So I wound up going to Kansas and said, I will be there for two, three years tops, and then I'll get out of there. So probably my second year of residency, Nick Thompson said that he was going to have like a pizza dinner with people, these people who had this different kind of health care. Um, there was this guy who was supposed to be special and famous or something like that with this program called Atlas, and he was going to be in town. So that was how I first heard about DPC, and I didn't go to the pizza dinner. <laughs> so I took the ideal way, but I thought, gosh, that sounds like not such a bad bad idea, but it's way too new. And so yes, I went to residency with these two doctors, Nick Thompson and Brandon Allman, who they opened up a direct primary in Wichita, saw how, yeah. how things went with them. Yeah. Um, and then I actually started, I met, had met my husband my second year of residency. We got married at the end of residency and we were planning on staying. So we had found what I really thought was going to be like my dream job. And I knew realistically, nobody, find, most people don't find their dream job right out of residency, but it was everything. So I did OB, I could do like minor surgeries, I could do inpatient adult, you know, cradle to grave, I delivered babies, I did C-sections, I did everything. And so I was doing that, but there were some problems of the practice and about two years into a very long contract that I would never recommend anybody else ever do a contract that long. I was starting to think maybe my practice wouldn't, wouldn't be able to support me. And then wound up not actually doing anything with it, just kind of tucked it away in the back of my mind. And at that, I went to lunch with them. And at that lunch, I was saying like, hey, maybe at some point, maybe you'll have a job opening for me. I'm kind of thinking, you know, that seems like a really good idea. Now you've proven that you haven't, you know, gone, you're not starving, you're doing okay. (laughs) And they said, yeah, well, let's see kind of what it what is possible at that point. But you should really think about doing your own practice. And I was like, no, no, no. No, no, no. Do you understand? Like, I am a doctor. I am not a business owner. So I completely like wrote that idea off. So that's how I I found out about it. What eventually led to the decision to open up Hope Family Medicine? Yeah. So I, um, I should have clarified, I live about 40 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes from them. So I'm kind of like, they're the big town, but where we've got a whole lot of farm in between us. So I was kind of going along and, um, at the very beginning of, uh, 2020, I found out I was pregnant with our son. And then shortly thereafter, I, um, in the very end of March, it's actually a a pretty awesome story that I love to tell people is that I, um, I had actually gone back up a little bit further in the fall. I went to um, nuts and bolts in Orlando in 2019. And I went there with this, like not 10 year plan, but like this two year plan. Like I'm just going to learn everything. I know I want to do PPC, but I did not want to open my own practice. But I had that kind of idea in my head then. So I, that was what, November of 2019. And then we found out we were pregnant and then this pandemic hit. And in March, we have these good friends who own a whole bunch of businesses in town and they will periodically, they're actually patients at another DPC in the, in Wichita. And they knew that I sort of had this idea and they're really supportive, encouraging. So they said, you should open a DPC here and you should rent out this building that we have for your DPC. And I said, well, that's nice, but you know, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) And then they said it again. And I said, well, that's nice. I don't think I'm going to do that. And then they said it again. I was like, that's nice, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. So in March, they said something to my husband instead of me. And so he said, sure, we'll go see this building. And I said, honey, I told them no. (laughs) 
<laughs> you, why did you say yes? You should have checked with me first. So he said, well, there's no harm in going to look at, at this building. So I said, okay, fine. We'll go look at this building on my day off on Wednesday. On Friday, I said, man, I think something's happening. And then on Monday, I no longer had a job. So the timing was just amazing mm -hmm. that I went to this place and I said, yeah, that looks wonderful. Like we'll do just these tiny little modifications, but it's not going to be anytime soon. So just think about it. And then literally it was less than a week later that I suddenly was like, okay, well now I don't have a job. So um, let's just do this. So we thought to ourselves so at the time, you know, I was pregnant. Nobody knew what really at that point, how safe it was for pregnant women and COVID. And I wasn't going to go start another like try to get a job, but we couldn't afford for me to not have a job. So we said, well, let's just, you know, do some telemedicine to get by and like hustle and try to put something together. And really our question was, do we want to open before I have a baby or after? And I decided it would be way less stressful to just open the practice first than to try to be worried to, I didn't want to spoil the the newborn phase with opening a practice. So yeah, so that was in April, May, and June. Actually, by June, I was already ready to open my practice, but I the building wasn't ready yet. So I spent, I hustled for two months. <laughs> and so I don't really know what it was that made me switch. I think it was just, I think that was probably it was that it just seemed like, I don't know that it was even a conscious decision as opposed to mentally like, they just everything just like lined up right and it just felt like the right thing to do. So I have always operated under the impression that like, well, we'll just figure it out. Like we'll if we're if that's what, you know, if I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing, then I then, you know, God will take care of it. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> and and so far that's that's proven true. <laughs> so that's and, so wonderful. And I think that you know, for, especially for people who are listening, who are in that space of like, ah, I'm a doctor, I'm not a business owner, but I'll learn about DPC. You know, it's, it's, I was in that same place of like, I, I eventually want to open up a DPC, but it's not, it's not now. And then for me, it was when I got threatened with being fired, it was like, oh, this is the day that I'm going to make the decision to do DPC. So I just, I say that as, you know, as a reminder to people, to collect all the information you can, because you never know if the time is right for you, you'll be armed with all of this information and empowered to be able to make decisions towards, you know, making your own DPC potentially. And I'll say that the business aspect of owning a practice, I, that was what I was most fearful of. And I have loved it. Like I would never have thought it. I know someone recently said something about, I forget the word, but somebody who like continually likes to learn new things. And I, apparently that's me because now I'm just like devouring everything there is to know, not about, not just about like a deep about DPC. There was that season too, but now it's like, business plans and not even business plans, but like the, you know, how to run a business well. And I just, I've loved learning it. I really have. So I would never have thought that I, I mean, never have thought that I would want to do that. I remember when I started at my previous uh, employed position, he said something about my, my contract lawyer said something about putting a provision in there to become a partner. And I was like, well, you can put that in there, but I don't want to be a partner. I want nothing to do with the business of medicine. And now I'm like, Hey, let's talk all about the business of medicine. <laughs> I want to ask about Hope Family Medicine, the name and where it came from, because on your website, you do share a little bit about the history of the, of the clinic's name, yeah. but I would love if you could share with the listeners how Hope Family Medicine came to be. Yeah. So one thing that my patients know is that they, I'm always, I've always been very open with them and I'm not afraid to share my story as a patient, as well as my story as a doctor. So they, I think that's something that my patients really, I mean, I know it is because they bring it up, but they really appreciate that I'm, they feel like I relate to them and I understand where they're coming from. You know, I was just talking to an OB patient of mine uh, this week who is stressed out because she's 
post dates and doesn't want to be induced. And, and they, they just said, gosh, I just feel so much better because you can tell me you've been there, you've been this and you, you understand. So, um, so I've always been really upfront about kind of our medical stuff. So I have it right on my website that when my husband and I first got married, um, pretty soon after it was actually just a couple weeks after I started my first real, you know, job where I am in my town now um, that we found out we were pregnant. And it's crazy because I knew from the beginning of that pregnancy that it was not there was something wrong. We didn't know until our, like our 18 week anatomy scan, we found out that I had an incompetent cervix. So long story short, we wound up having a, a very, very dramatic, very complicated, very hard first pregnancy that wound up with me, us having a stillborn and me winding up in the ICU. And our daughter that we had, her name, we had named her Hope. And so I kind of had always, it's always been important for me to have something that we named that just, that we would name after her that would kind of just be sort of her legacy. And also, I think just the name, like I didn't want, because we knew her whole pregnancy that we were going to, it was unlikely that it was, it was just a hard thing that people could get really depressed and down about. And we just said, no, we just have hope. Like we just, it's going to be okay. And even though I did not think that she was going to make it and she didn't, but so um, I think hope signifies a lot. It's obviously first and foremost named after our first daughter, but I think it means a lot, just hope about medicine in general that that I mean really DPC has been a lot of hope for me because there's so much that's frustrating in healthcare. There's so much that's frustrating in in family medicine. And then also so many of my patients struggle with mental health issues with depression and anxiety. And I just had a couple different variations of the word hope that we considered, but there was no question in my mind that that was what the name was going to be. In fact, and even when I thought about do I want to have a partner from the beginning said, well, if I have a partner, they might want a different name. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's, it's a wonderful tribute because not only does, you know, it, it stand out on your sign, but when your patients find your care to be helping them find hope in whatever their, you know, their health issue or mental issue is, I think that's wonderful. So thank you for sharing that. In addition to Hope Family Medicine, you're also doing locums. And so you're not opted out of Medicare. So can you share about how that decision came to be? And then also has opting, has not opting out of Medicare impacted your practice at all? Uh, Yeah. So quick to answer to that is a little bit, but it's definitely not the end of the world. So I initially, because I had I had a plan. I had a one-year plan. It was all mapped out. It didn't happen at all the way that was when I unexpectedly had a pandemic happen while I was four months pregnant and lost my job and didn't know what was going on. And so the financial plan that we had in order to save up money for this practice didn't didn't even come close to happening. So we knew right off of that that I had to find a different way to be able to pay bills while I was building up the practice. So initially we thought we were going to do telemedicine and there was such a need for telemedicine. And then there was such an overflow of doctors trying to do telemedicine. So that did not come out at all. So I started doing locums with this group that I'd actually been with since I graduated residency. Um, So I had an established relationship with them. And then when my son was when I kind of had come out of that new, the postpartum maternity leave, there you go. When I came out of maternity leave, he, uh, we said, okay, we need to do something else. So after my sort of pseudo maternity leave, I decided to start picking up some locum shifts. I talked with the organization and said, I was just plain done with ER. I decided there are some things that just have to go. And I knew that with DPC, I still wanted to do something with maternity, but I didn't want to deliver babies. And I knew that I didn't want to do ER anymore. So they had some shifts for me where I was covering in. So basically I've done, I'm now on my third one where sometimes things blow up um, and sometimes it's not so dramatic, but basically they lose 
a doctor and they need a doctor to fill in, they usually have like a nurse practitioner or a couple of nurse practitioners. And then, and then we come in and kind of fill in the gap for the physician part of it. And so I am opted in because of that. But really the only thing is that I've had a few people call. I get people who call and want to become patients and they're on Medicare. And I just say, Hey, I'm not ready yet. I'm not there yet, but I can put you on a wait list. So I have one and exactly one patient who was my patient before who wanted to continue to be my patient and she's on Medicare and I see her for free because she basically came to me in tears like the third time. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to see you. (laughs) And then outside of that, I just, I just will tell people when I, when I opt out, I'll let them know. And you're able to see your patient because you can see your patient for free and it's not taking away from the patients who are paying in your practice. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, you know, you, you just kind of do it. (laughs) So I didn't plan on seeing, I'm not advertising that I'm seeing people for free. I'm not, you know, I've had patients who asked to be patients and they had Medicare and I told them no, but this one I told yes. And so you don't have to feel encumbered to say, well, if I say yes to this one, I have to say yes to everyone. You can do things on a case by case basis. I just had a patient who said, sent me a message tonight saying, what's your re-enrollment fee? And with this one, I was tempted to say, um, like, $5,000. I don't know. (laughs) But you know, you can, you know, you don't have to say you can change your policy all the time if you want to. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's a great strategy in terms of when you're building out your legal documents for your patients to sign as like a membership agreement, you can have, you know, referencing the member agreement in addendum A or appendix A. And that is the document that you can change all the time. So it absolutely gives you that ability to pivot wherever you need to. Now, I want to ask with regards to your patient who you are seeing for free, how do you handle a membership agreement for that patient? People gave me several contracts. I looked them over, I picked one and adjusted it for myself and then had a lawyer look it over. So I think that's a really reasonable and affordable way to do it. And I think there's just a disclaimer in there that I'm not opted out. And then I put in there a note for under membership price. And you can't, you can't like ask them, you can let see people for free, but you can't ask them for like, yeah. So I just, I just put a line through the price and just put zero there. And then she, I just told her like literally verbally, I just said, so, you know, I hope that when I can start charging you that you won't quit at that point. And she's like, well, no, that would not be the point, but I understand. And if she does, oh, well, she does. In terms of your practice and for the patients who are not needing to worry about if you're opted in or opted out, on your FAQ, you have a piece about saving money and it says no copays, no inflated costs, breaking down barriers to get quick and high quality care may mean an averted hospital stay or ER visit. And since our focus can shift from treating illness to promoting wellness, that means an overall healthier you, which certainly saves you money. So I wanted to ask there, when you have had patients come to your practice how have they found you and how have you explained your value proposition to people about Hope Family Medicine, given that you're, you know, in the Midwest, only 40 minutes away from Antioch? It's been a smattering. It's pretty much, I'm in a small town. It's kind of big news. It's not tiny town. So it's not that real, real rural, but it's a small town where people, not everybody knows each other, but word spreads fast. And so in our town, we have one, two, three family practices outside of mine, and then an internal medicine, and then a solo pediatrician, a surgeon, and two OBGYNs. So just to get kind of an idea, we have, we're the county seat. So, so we have a hospital and it, it's a small community hospital. It's not a critical access hospital, but everything is all in one spot. They said that there have been people in the past who haven't been in the hospital, but so I disappeared for a few months. People thought that I left. Some people thought that I was having pregnancy complications, but kind of people knew that I left. 
And then people knew that I popped up in a new place. And so I think that word spreads pretty quickly. But even so, I get people now who are like, oh, I didn't realize you were still here. I just went to a community event today and I had somebody who was a former patient. Hey, like you're here. So I think a lot of my patients, it's word of mouth. A lot of them have said they found me on Facebook, which is funny because I don't, I'm not very good at all or consistent at all at, at social media. And then I have an employer group. I have some people who were patients at Atlas or Antioch or some of the other DPCs in the area who just were excited that I was close because that, they liked DPC, but but it was a trek so to get to the big city. How often do you have patients then who don't know about DPC and how do you talk with them about your practice? So I would say some do, but the majority of time they don't. I have had people who there's a a registry on the hospital website of all the doctors. I've had several patients who've called me up just saying, I'm new to the area. I'm looking for a doctor. And I say, well, are you aware that our practice is different? And they're like, no, I was just calling you from the list. And so I say, okay, well, here's what our practice is. And they'd never heard it before. And I've had patients sign up as members. I think probably the majority of the time when that happens, they're uninsured patients to begin with. A lot of times people, yeah, I think that's just where it is. So sometimes people will get, if they have Medicaid, they'll like call the name on their card or something like that. But if they're uninsured, they just kind of cold call or the urgent care has um, passed me a few patients, but they pass me patients saying, Hey, you don't have insurance, go to this doctor. (laughs) So, so I do sometimes have to do some re-education where they think that I am the doctor for people who don't have insurance, but they don't really understand you can come here if you do have insurance or this is not fee, you know, it's not a cash based doctor. It's a direct primary care doctor. It's not a one time they say, well, do you just want to see me? You know, can I just see you one time? But overall, I think people, I, I have a pretty decent, I think, conversion rate. I really just say, Hey, you know, I'm a family doctor. I think being a family doctor is really valuable. And part of that is knowing my patients. So I think if we really want to get to the root of this problem you just told me about, I need to know you and it might not take one visit. It might take a couple visits. And then once we get through that, you might have something else going on. So, you know, if you pay this monthly membership, one or two urgent care visits, and that's a year's worth of your membership. And you can come in as many times as you need to in order to get your problem solved and get you back to back to healthy. Yeah. So I think that goes over pretty well with a lot of people. With you mentioning urgent care, how much does it cost for an uninsured patient to go to your guys's local urgent care per visit? So it's, I think it depends. It depends on what it is. So our urgent care in our town is through our hospital. So they just bought a location and opened up an urgent care like on the fly a couple years back. So it's basically it's run by APPs and um, it's kind of just like a mini branch of the hospital. It is in a separate location though, but they it depends on on what it is that they go in there for. I've had patients sometimes tell me what what it is, and it's I just kind of put it in my head as a ballpark of three four hundred dollars. If people are listening and they they weren't aware, because I wasn't aware until I heard this from my lawyer, Apollonia Udell, that you can actually call the urgent care locally and just ask, how how much does it cost for me to be seen at the urgent care because they don't have insurance? And so at our urgent care locally, it's $247 to walk in the door. And then if, depending on the codes, it goes up from there. So it's a, it's a good tool to have in your in your decision box as you're building out your business. Yeah. Yeah. I just ballpark tell people two trips to the urgent care. Cause I'll, actually I'd say a lot of times when someone comes to me from the urgent care, it's when they went to the urgent care, they didn't get better. They went back to the urgent care and then they were told to come to me. So I say, you know, those two trips to the urgent care equals like a year's worth of membership. Yeah. So with you mentioning that, I want to ask, how did you come to your pricing? Yeah, so I kind of, 
I thought a lot about it, like a lot of people do. I looked at calculations of what my per member per month needed to be. I thought of all these things. And then ultimately I said, you know what? I'm close enough to several other DPCs. I probably just need to match them pretty closely. And so, but then I thought, I I rounded down a little bit, but I didn't really. So I initially had age-based pricing and it was roughly comparable to them, not higher. So if there was a debate between two practices, I kind of went with the lower option and I kind of thought, well, I'm... I'm more, they can pull from more people, whereas I'm more a very blue collar, lower average income location. So I just don't think that I can, I don't think that it would go over well for me to be more expensive than the big, big town nearby. And so initially I was age-based, but I didn't like the idea of age-based. I said, you know, if you're, I mean, even in fee for service, you know, a 99213 is going to be a 99213 no matter their age. When I hit the one year mark, I, I flipped it to be just child, adult, and family. I really wanted to simplify it. I wanted to be able to say in a one liner. That's how I wound up switch, switching it a little bit. I actually considered switching at six months and I posted it actually in the DPC women's group and got. I think basically people said, don't do it yet. That's not what they said, but I read between the lines and it's, they basically said, it doesn't sound like you need to switch. So I didn't. And I'm glad that I didn't because I got my first business then. And so I like exploded, I almost doubled like overnight, literally on January 1st. And so I'm glad that I didn't switch it then. But what I found was I had, i I still do have a majority of like single people, not single, but you know, one person in the family or a single person. And I really want to take care of family. So I wanted something that was, I wanted to change it up so that because I realized I'm really good at giving out discounts and things. And so I needed more buffer so that I could afford those. And I really wanted to emphasize family. So I switched it up so that I actually kept the same family max, but the way I think that it was worded on my website, I feel like it was more family oriented, maybe by saying like individual couple or family rather than this age, this, this age, this, this age, this, but no more than this for a family by just saying single family couple, you know, single couple family. As soon as I made that switch, I had like three families sign up within two weeks and it was it was awesome. And it also was reaffirming that I really do love taking care of a whole family. So that's been nice. That's awesome. And in terms of your demographics, can you break down your patient population for us? Yeah. So right now I have about 130 patients and about a third of them our company and two thirds of them are from, you know, just from the community. I'd say probably half to two thirds of them have, I should have specific numbers, but I've never been a big numbers person, Uh, but about half to two thirds of them have insurance. I'd say if you count cost sharing programs, it's probably two thirds of them have cost sharing program or insurance. And then about a third of them are uninsured. When you're an entrepreneur and you're talking about people with your business, about growth, about uh, retention, about churn, how do you handle when people are like, this is the way to do it. And this is, if you don't do it this way, it's not a, that's not a good decision. Yeah. I, I want to say that in, at least in our women's group, I don't think people are so much of the, this is the way to do it. Sometimes in other groups, you certainly get that. I've never been really, I guess I really like one of the things I miss about having my own practice is I really like collaborating with people. So I always like to bounce ideas off people. And so I will bounce an idea off it and see if I agree with that idea. Usually I don't throw things out there to see what other people think, but to affirm what I'm thinking. And I think that's important as a doctor too. I mean, you you don't want to just, well, I don't know. And I'm going to look this up. You think, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Let me go see if this is affirming that or if this, if I need, need to rethink it. So I try to 
be, be confident in my own decisions. And I think I, a lot of times I am, but sometimes I just need that. Well, just like the doctor on the airplane on the way back from Ethiopia, where I kind of thought, I think I need to do this. And he said, no, don't do it. And it just affirmed that I needed to do it. You know, you, you can have people say yes or no, and it'll confirm, you know, if, if, if you get this knee jerk reaction that, know they're wrong, then you better just go with what you're, (laughs) what you're, you were planning. That was the opposite of what they just recommended. It's such a cool place to be in though, especially in the DPC women's group, because you have people coming from all different backgrounds. And I agree with you that the support and the collaboration that we might not get as micro practitioners is very welcome in a lot of senses. And I'd say also some I love listening to podcasts, especially with my locums. I love my little like time to just sit and listen to podcasts and definitely my DVC stories on my roster. <laughs> but I realize that there are things that don't that are just in the my business podcasts are just not applicable to being a family doctor business. So, and, and it's not supposed to, but sometimes there's, there's areas where it's just, you can't get that information from there because their, their goal is to make money. And our goal is to take care of people and we want to make money while we're doing it. But you know, with that, we have the, the end goal is different. And so it, it really is valuable to have a network of people who are in the same line of business, um, to be able to bounce ideas off of. I love that. I want to go back to when you were saying that in January of 2021, your business just pretty much doubled overnight. Mm -hmm. What was going on internally at that time in terms of how you were figuring out how you were going to handle that good situation to be in? So I would not recommend that people do what I did in January. Growing is great. And actually had this conversation with my parents earlier today where my mom is worried that I don't, I'm not growing fast enough and other people are amazed at how quickly I've grown. And I say, you know, I'm growing as fast as I can handle. And I have not really advertised because I haven't, I've been growing as fast as I can handle. And maybe if I had more, you know, our family had more financial buffer than I could grow faster. And then, you know, but I've had to do the locums. And so I could only manage to to grow so much at once. And when, what happened in January is I um, had a, a, a company that wanted to work with me and they were bigger than I want. They were the higher end. And they wanted to start on January 1st. And I'd already committed to starting a new locums job on January. So I, and then for whatever reason, probably because other people had their own insurances start over at the beginning of the year, I just had all these private people. I had this new company and I had a new locums position all start at the beginning of the year. And it was it was way overwhelming. Like it was way too much. I just kept this perspective that I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be like this forever. We were going to get, we were going to get through getting all these people onboarded and I would probably make a mistake or two, but I was going to make a mistake or two no matter what. And I did on January 1st, New Year's Day at eight o'clock in the morning, I got a notification that all of my employees from my new employer group, their charges all went through. And I was like, hold on a second. None of them were supposed to get charges. What is this? And then I get this flurry of like message, like the, the person who I worked with at the company. So there was a button that you, there was like some place that nobody ever told me about where it was like switched over to the, the patients all being charged rather than the company all being charged. I didn't know about this button until I accidentally charged like 40 new employees all at once. So that was That was an exciting thing, but I have to say the customer support, I mean, the guys over at Atlas, they were, they were phenomenal. I mean, it's New Year's Day and by 10 o'clock. So that happened at eight by 1030, it was all better. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. And that is the, uh, the common thread over at Atlas and, and with Kirk's support. So yeah, so (laughs) that's, that's incredible. Now, when you mention 
that you were growing as as fast as you wanted as you wanted to and as you could handle. I want to ask about that being a mom of little ones and having a position in the locums, having your DPC yeah. practice. How do you decide what you can handle? Yeah. So I will say that in high school, I did too much as I think most doctors in high school, they did too much in college. Someone gave me the idea that you should like not do too much. And I don't know why, but I took it really to heart. And so I always wanted to like create balance and make sure that I didn't overdo it. I said, I wanted to do one thing for me and one thing for others in college. And that's what I did. I didn't sign up for a million groups. I signed up for one group for myself or one thing for myself. And then one thing that was like outwardly focused. And I've always kind of kept that principle. I love the concept of like work-life balance is not 50-50. It is like being present where you are and being focused on the right the right thing in that moment where when you're here, you are here, now, like be here now. And, and that will go through seasons where we need to spend more time on this or more time on that. So we may need to be more in work at one time and be more in home at another time. So I balance like a teeter totter, it is, it is just focusing in the right places. And, and also just having that margin. These are, I think, all things that are hard concepts, they may be easy in, um, in concept, but in actually applying it, especially with the typical doctor mentality of like, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. It's a hard thing to do. But I have gotten very comfortable with saying no, like I waited a long time for this family. And I am not going to miss these moments with my kids, or I waited a long time to meet my husband. And I'm not going to, you know, these are priorities for me. So it's, even though it, I would say it's absolutely a busy season in life, I still feel like I am I'm get able to choose the time with my family that I want. So one of the things that I'm struggling with right now is with locums. I'm away overnight. And I hate that because no one sleeps. No one sleeps. I don't sleep because I'm worried about them. They don't sleep because I'm not there. My husband doesn't sleep because they don't sleep. <laughs> so it's hard. But at the same time, I don't feel like I'm missing out on their life because it's a, you know, Tuesday morning and it's my, you know, daughter's first day of preschool and I'm there. I'm not, you know, rushing in. And um, the daycare that my kids are at right now, I didn't go to them when I was employed because they pick up was 530 and my husband worked his hours were later so I knew he couldn't do pickup and I couldn't get off for pickup at 530 and now they're there and I am out the door at 515 so I can get there for pickup at 530 and that's something that like I literally couldn't do it before and now it's that's just the way it is and that's the priority and I feel like that's important. So that's what's happening. I love that. And for, you know, if you have kids or not, if you have, you know, some hobby that you cherish, or you have something that adds to that ability to balance your life out to, you know, to fill your soul. Mm -hmm. I just, I challenge people who are listening to think about, you know, what, what matters to them, because every time I see DPC doctors celebrating, I did the uh, the practice bus run with my kid who's going into first grade today because I can, because I'm a DPC doctor. Or, you know, I was able to, like yourself, pick my kids up from daycare or make uh, a school play or whatever it is. Clearly, those examples are family related, but the idea to uh, the, to have the days and the hours that you choose, so empowering compared to a lot of employed positions where like you're sharing, you you don't have that autonomy to make those decisions all the time in employed positions. I just had a conversation with my husband about going to visit my family back on the East Coast. And oh. I love that we can just talk about when it's going to work best for us and when it's going to work best for my family rather than when 
my promise is going to give me permission to go. And I love that, you know, I have a really nice ah! arrangement with one of the other DPC docs in solo docs in the area where it really hasn't happened, but someday I am going to cash in on it. And so, you know, we can, we can trade call for each other if we need to, but a lot of times we just don't even do it because if I'm, if I go out of, town for, you know, my locums, a lot of times I'll, I'll answer those calls over my lunch break or in before I go in or after I'm done. And then if they need to be seen, we'll either do a telemedicine visit or we'll do, or we'll set something up for the next day. And like, they don't, you know, like I said, I'm very upfront with my patients. So most of them know I do something else, but they, I don't, I don't announce it every time I go out of town because it's still relatively seamless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, patients I find in my own area are still wrapping their heads around that care does not have to be delivered in an in-person visit in the clinic. That, you know, through the pandemic, we've all been exposed to telemedicine, but I, I still have patients who are like, oh, so you don't need to see me in person to go over my lab results. And I'm like, yes, that's correct. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's great that you can still, you know, like you're like, most DPC doctors do give give care, even though you're not maybe physically able to see a person that day. Yeah, yeah. And they still don't also, they also do not get the concept that they don't have to pay a no-show fee. <laughs> so they are like, I'm so sorry, I'll pay for the visit anyway. I said, you already did. You know, if they have to cancel like the day before, I'm like, it's fine. Let's just move it. Hey, more time for me to do other stuff. <laughs> so they, they'll say, well, I'll, I'll pay the no show. I'll still pay for the visit. <laughs> like, you already did. <laughs> That's yeah. it. There's no more. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Now, what about vacation? I'm assuming your patients still pay the membership, even if you're on vacation, if you don't take the calls personally and you have someone covering you. Yeah. So I have a little spiel that I'll tell them. I just say, you know, I am, you know, if you need to reach me in the evenings or on the weekends, I would, I love saving people urgent care visits. I am still a human and I still have family. So I'm not 24 seven, 365 days a year. So if I go out of town, um, I'm often able to just still address whatever needs you have. That's why it's so great that you can reach me on my cell phone. If for some reason or at some point I do finally get to take that vacation and then I usually make a joke about how the only vacation I've taken so far was is maternity leave, which is obviously not a vacation. Yeah, so I've, I've done little things here and there, but... I, I tell them, I will, you still call the same number. I just route it on to the other doctor and don't worry. It's not like you'll be surprised. I'll send out an email. So check your emails. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I just give them, I tell them, I'll give them a heads up if I'm going to be out long enough where I feel like I need to have someone to cover for me. But otherwise, if I think it's something that I can handle remotely, then I, I will. Awesome. And I want to ask, because you've, you've mentioned El Dorado, not El Dorado is a small town you're 40 minutes from Wichita. And I want to go back to the fact that you are a rural DPC solo doctor. So what are some words of wisdom that you can share with others who may be thinking about opening in a rural location and are hesitant because they're fearful that it might not work or they're fearful about they won't, they won't have a rapid growth? What are some words of wisdom that you found out of practicing in a rural DPC? I think it can be done anywhere. And I don't think, oh, you can make it work anywhere. I think that it does work anywhere. I, I think I took to heart that there are, I am not the first one. And that's where I think it's been helpful that I can see, I know some of the towns where some of the very seasoned DPC docs where they have their practices. And I knew that some of them were more remote than ours. I'm close enough to a larger place where DPC is well known, where I feel like they're, I'm, I ride a little bit on their coattails. Really, to me, my goal was to, and this is why it made sense for me to open where I am and not somewhere else. My goal was to reach those people in the middle, the people who were small business owners who were, you know, we think classically of farmers, but what I found is I have people like farriers, which if you don't know, they're horse 
shoers. <laughs> I have, you know, like handymen, a lot of people who kind of just work for themselves. And so I think that it works. It's a, it, it's, it meets a need for people in small towns and in rural communities. And I think it's just in that regard, it's about just explaining, educating, because there are plenty, if you think about it, you know, even if your goal is 600 people, there's a whole lot more than 600 people, even in rural communities and rural counties, there's still more than 600 people. So you think like a lot of these people need what we've got. And so I think if you go into it with that mentality of, I just need to explain to them how I'm addressing their need when I'm filling their, that, that void in what they have, I'm helping them I'm, I'm breaking down that barrier. I'm helping them get to the healthcare that they, they want to have and they haven't previously had the access to. So I don't think there's necessarily something magical about it. I do think that a lot of rural folks are, they still have that, like they're even fee-for-service doctors in some communities will do house calls, I think more than in other places. And so I think they still kind of have I think it's more recent memory for a lot of people. Like, yeah, I did grow up with a doctor who did all these things or, or yeah, my, our family doctor did everything. And so it's, it's more recent that doctors in our area stopped doing a lot of those things. Um, But outside of that, I think, I mean, I, I think that you just, it is a different beast, but it's not, (laughs) you know, the people, the culture is different. The people are different, but, but caring for people is the same. Growing up in Sacramento, which is a very big town compared to my town of 4,000, I completely agree with that because, you know, you even if you, in our town, for example, and I'm sure it's the same in El Dorado for you, like, if your car is not in your driveway for a few days, like people start asking like, oh, are they on vacation? You know, so oh, it's, yeah. uh, it is a very different culture. And this idea that when you're sharing that, like, you're giving people the healthcare that they, you know, deserve and are, and are looking for, it's, you're going back to, you're giving them hope that they can have the care that they are in need of and well-deserving of. So that's great. Just a little funny story about that. So we, this is how I knew I was in a small town is that our postman, um, he knew that we were opening the practice and he knew that I wasn't like in there all the time. So he's like, hey, do you want me to just bring bring your mail to your house instead if I see that the office is closed? And I was like, great, that's wonderful. He's like, well, I already started doing it. I was like, yeah, I was wondering how that package got in our house. And then the other funny thing is that our the FedEx guy is not local, and but he still has that vibe. Uh, there were a couple times where I started getting these sorry we missed you notes on our door, and I was like, I don't understand. I was here all day. How could you miss me? I realized what he was doing was I live really close to my office, and so sometimes I'll walk. I like I try whenever I can to walk, and so he didn't realize that just because my car wasn't there. He knew my car and it, he would say, oh, her car's not there. She's not there. But I was just walking. And so I finally caught him. I was like, hey, you can't just assume that because my car is not there, that I'm not there. So it, it does happen where people are like, hey, I noticed your car was missing. I had a patient yesterday who called and said, hey, I saw you leaving the clinic. And so I thought I'd just call and update you. I did finally make it in to see my counselor. I was like, great. That's wonderful. Thank you for updating me. I'm running late for daycare. (laughs) That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Love it. Love it. Now you've mentioned Atlas. What are the tools that you use for your DPC to run the everyday functions? So I I do use Atlas. I just recently started using some self-scheduling through Calendly and I just use the free version. I don't really see a reason why not. And it's actually been a nice workflow. I debated that one way too long and then I just did it and it's been fine. So they still text me. I'm still got that complete hands-on and complete control. I do have a virtual assistant who works a few hours a week, but I don't they don't really do anything patient for facing. Um, it's all 
office work type stuff like faxing and, and referrals. But so scheduling is all still through me. So they text me or call me. I decide, yeah, you do need to be seen. Here's your link. And so they'll do that. So that's been a really nice feature to kind of save on a lot of that back and forth. As far as other, I guess, tech and tools, I do have a Cardia 6 lead. I like it. It's not a substitute for an EKG. So I, I haven't used it quite as much as I thought that I would or as I started to at first. Never underestimate the power of exam paper. Yeah, exam paper has come to the rescue so many times for me. I know that sounds crazy. This is not tech or tool, but it is true. So today I went to my first vendor, not vendor event, but like a community event where I actually had a table. I was a sponsor and I couldn't find the tablecloth. So I just got some exam paper and put that as my tablecloth and it worked out just fine. The first day that I did a pap smear in my office, I realized there was a food truck that was set up outside the window and I I hadn't thought to put any window coverings on. So I just got some tape and some table paper and I had an instant <laughs> I've had crazy kids and you just rip off some paper and they can color. So yes, table paper. That is my, <laughs> my tech. Um, no, I, I did invest in a good scale, but I'm a pretty low tech office. I'd say I am very simple. I think it would be amazing to get a butterfly queue at some point, but I really don't know that I can justify it this time. I love that. And you know, everybody has, I, I think that's a genius tip. I, I honestly do because it's a very realistic tip in terms of everyone who's worked with exam table paper can can just picture everything that you just described. I'm going to mention a couple of things that I know that the people who I'm pulling these examples from are going to laugh at, but having batteries, like that's a tool uh, to back up your, your equipment, um, having like, you know, tampons or sanitary pads in the bathroom. That's something somebody had mentioned on DPC women's group. So the exam table paper is genius and so, so useful. Yeah. yeah so wonderful. Yeah. And oh, I will say it is super valuable having a kid's table. So I know with COVID, we there's not tons and tons of toys out there, but I made a, a move that I'm going to go ahead and call as genius. Um, I took the, the kid's corner and I moved it out of the waiting room and put it into the exam room. So now, because you know when mom is getting her pelvic exam or whatever, that's when you want to have something for the kids, not necessarily when they're in the waiting room where they don't actually need to wait. So we moved that out and now it's perfect because I've got a little coffee nook that my husband is working on building and there's more room for that and kids are happy in the exam room. So yeah, so that that's a big thing. <laughs> awesome. And then in terms of resources, you had mentioned business podcasts that aren't not aren't necessarily doctor and business combined. But yeah. what are some of the podcasts that you love in that library of yours when you're listening on your locum's job? Yeah. So I will say I have, uh, so my like just women in business podcasts, I've got biz chicks and, uh, the Christy Wright show used to be business boutique. When it was business boutique, there was a lot of really, really great episodes, especially the original initial couple seasons where there was some just like gold in there. And now she does a little bit more like life advice type stuff, but still also helpful. And then kind of medical business focused would probably the main one is the social dentist. I listen to her as far as that stuff goes, although I don't know that how much of it I, I'm applying now, but it's all going into the back of my mind for when I have tons more time. And then just, I think, other things that are interesting. What do I have? Like white coat investor and paradox Oh, I think those are some of the big ones. And advice to other physicians who are looking to start a DPC practice. What additional words of wisdom can you say, can you share with them in closing? Yeah, so not anything completely unique or original. I would just say 
I think that you just need to be confident that you are, you made it through med school and you know how to do this. And just because somebody else did it one way does not mean that that's how you have to do it. And just because something worked for someone else doesn't mean that it works for you. And um, I think that that's something that we are really good at comparing ourselves to other people. And you just need to figure out what's what's right for you, what's right for your community. It's going to be different. I My practice is completely different than the practices that I really, in a lot of ways, modeled myself after just for the sake of who I am, what my personality is, um, what my town demographics are like, and things that I couldn't have even necessarily anticipated. So I think, I think mainly... I see people all the time way overthinking, like I have to have everything ready. I have to have everything planned out. I have to have this much money in the bank. I have to have all these markers and get all these goals and have all this equipment. I had a budget of zero when I started and I had all these ideas, but no plans. And I just, you know, that totally cliche, like build your wings on the way down. I just figured it out as I went. Like I, I mean, it wasn't clueless, but I just made it happen. And I checked in with people along the way. I utilized the resources, but I also utilized them knowing that, okay, that's how they did it. Now, how do I want to do it based off of what they did? So I love that. And, you know, just, just being in the space of being about to open, it's, I've, I wasn't expecting it because I've been in too many weeks of just overwhelm with regards to what to finish before opening day. But I feel that what you're saying is really sage advice that you, you take what you have learned, you build out what you need to do for your clinic. And it, it, it almost for, for me, and I don't know if it was the same for you, the things that you have to do sort of narrows down as you get more clarity and closer to opening day. Yeah. Yeah. You still feel, even if everything is perfect and everything is going according to plan, you'll still get imposter syndrome. Uh, That's just reality. There's still times where I feel like, oh gosh, I'm not really owning this business. I'm not really this doctor. And then there's other times where I was like, who's telling me not? I can totally do that. That It is because I said it is. <laughs> and you just kind of have to have this like confidence. Really, a lot of it is just about being confident, even when you're not feeling confident, acting confident, and not in an arrogant way, but in a decision-making Let's get things done. You know what? Maybe there's not a precedent and I'm just going to build this now. Or maybe there is a precedent and I'm just going to prove that I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it my way too. Now, for those who would like to reach out to you after this podcast, what is the best way to reach you? Okay. So on Instagram, Hope Family Medicine DPC. On Facebook, it's Dr. Christina Gonzalez and it's Christina, oh, D-O. So Christina with a C-H and Gonzalez with two Zs, one in the middle, one at the end. Or uh, you can reach out to me through my website, hopefamilymedicinedpc.com. It's a mouthful, but I think you can figure it out. (laughs) Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, for joining us today. Yes, it was so good to talk with you and... Yeah, I feel like we're old friends, even if we haven't met. (laughs) Soon, soon we will. Next week, look forward to hearing from Dr. Naran Alajwa of Silverdale Pediatrics in Silverdale, Washington. Our first season will be wrapping up soon, and we are already prepping for season two. If you're a physician in the DPC ecosystem who would like to be featured, please visit the Contact Us section of MyDPCStory.com. And coming out this week will be the My DPC Story Listener Survey. This survey is geared towards finding out what you, the listeners, love about the pod and about how we can grow and continue spreading the word about direct primary care. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Tell your friends, too. For more information on this episode and much more, including DPC swag like drinkware and clothing all representing the love of DPC, please visit MyDPCStory.com. Also, for the latest in DPC news, check out dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.